A routine red-eye flight between Kuala Lumpur and Beijing turned into a nightmare for hundreds of families. An enormous Boeing 777 wide-body jet went missing with over 200 souls on board. The lack of transparency from authorities only added insult to the incalculable injury of loved ones vanishing without a trace. Ten years since it went missing, families are still searching for answers, combing through what happened in those early days with the singular goal of finding their lost loved ones. This week's episode is The Disappearance of Flight MH370, Part 1. Sinister Well, after having read a lot of stuff about the um, mental health of pilots and some statistics, I don't love that we're about to go back out on tour (laughs) Yeah, and have to get on a bunch of airplanes Uh because you really are, we're all really trusting that um, the one or two people up in that cockpit have our best interest in mind and are going to do whatever they can to make sure we arrive safely at our destination. Yeah. I, uh, I did not realize until listening to, um, and we linked the books that I'll reference the show notes, the, not the Richard quest book, but by Ian Higgins, who is a journalist out of Australia. And he's very comprehensive in that when he mentions possibilities, there will be a tangent and be like much like this flight in, you know, 2011 or this flight in 2009 where the pilot was depressed and, and took over the cabin or this one where this happened. And obviously if there are at any given point, like 20,000 aircraft in the sky at a time and make it to their destination and millions of flights a year are fine, all well and good, but it is sort of shakes your core Mm -hmm. when you're like, Oh, it's not that it never happens. It's just it rarely happens, but it does happen. That it does happen. Somebody's just like, I'm going to aim this towards the, the ocean, some mountains in another situation. Uh, and you see that there are uh, there should be safeguards in place. And I think hopefully there are now safeguards in place where if that even started, there's an inkling of something like that. You know, fighter jets are scrambled and you would Mm -hmm. respond. But the fact that you would even need that is, like you said, we're really, it's rickety to just have two people up there going, let's go. You guys ready? (laughs) Like a bus driver. I guess. And I mean, really, if you think about it, it is like any transportation bus, Uber, Lyft, anything. I mean, even driving your own car, you oftentimes don't have control of that. But I'm always more worried about the other people on the road. Because I don't know who's behind the wheel of that, you know, like what they've Mm -mm. been doing, what they've been drinking or using or just their mental state. Mm -hmm. Stories like this just always it's a grim and eye opening reminder of that fine line. We're all walking all the time and how much trust we put in other people that um we're going to be okay. And I think, and I'm not saying we shouldn't because I don't want to be a pessimist like that. It's just, um, this story has always really fascinated me. It's always been, uh, I've, you know, like many people, I think I had all these like conspiracy theories of what could have happened and who it's, you know, it's still, no one has definitively said what did Mm -hmm. happen. Having, Read and watched a lot about this now. I have my own theory that I feel is pretty likely. And it makes me just realize that it's often the simplest explanations to all of these cases. And it's pertinent not only because this is the 10 year anniversary of this, but also with the just the mechanical issues with Boeing aircrafts that have been mm-hmm. happening right now. Oh A my tire God. just flew off. Did you see that tire that? Being a thank God nobody was in the car, but a tire on a Boeing triple seven shot off in California like this week or, or last week, early last week from the sky. And, yeah, yeah. The landing gear, it the wheel just flew off one of the big ass like wheels. I don't, I don't oh. mean to laugh, but the, the video is ridiculous. No, if that if you're driving down the highway and that comes yeah. at you, you're done. Yeah, it flew into luckily a unoccupied vehicle in a parking lot. Uh, like a park and ride at the airport, you come back and your fucking car is just Dude. annihilated in the same exact spot you left it. And you're like, 
what, who did this? But they had to make an emergency landing in at LAX because I think they took off from San Francisco and were trying to fly to Asia. I mean, it was going to be a long haul flight and it was like, we can't land without a wheel. So we're well, going to have to pull not. over. Yeah. Yeah. Let's pull over. Not. And then the, the door plug shooting off of the other yeah. one. And Terrifying. Yeah, just been all these kind of issues that it makes you... Sorry if you're listening to this on a plane, by the way. I know people download <laughs> these episodes to listen to on a plane. Yeah. But we're, you're just... This is kind of shows you the, the need for, like, policies, procedures, doing mental health screenings, physical health screenings, physical airplane screenings, asking questions if things go a little bit sideways. Reporting uh, if things. Like, if you see a loved one in distress and, yeah, you know, maybe... Um, saying something to their employer, especially if their job is flying a plane with hundreds of people on it. Yeah, it's, it's wild. It is wild. And this is a wild story. And a recent new documentary came out about it on the BBC. Netflix has a docu-series out that I believe we watched in um, Utah. Yeah, or no, it was when we were in Oregon and uh, Oregon, Mount Hood. Oregon, that's it, yeah. But the CNA Insider documentary that just came out for the 10-year anniversary, one of the women, and she's not alone, said, you know, we haven't even had any kind of memorial. She said, I didn't even yeah. get to walk through a church with his photo and light a candle and kind of say, this is over. So for them, it's all still very real and raw and true. So we will also be mindful of that, that even mm -hmm. though this is to all of us a big mystery to a ton of people, it's a gaping wound that will never be healed until until all of them just say, we just want some type of answer. Yeah. We want something to be found or some sort of definitive answer where it's not a mystery to those people any longer. They yeah. can have an idea of, of what happened on that flight and where their loved ones might be now. At least, mm -hmm. even if it's like we can't recover them, at least knowing like a finite location, I think, mm -hmm. would bring closure to a lot of people. Yeah, she's like, I don't even have a grave to visit or like a yeah. you know a mausoleum to go to or something. So to even say like, we'll take this pilgrimage together, you know, as families that maybe, you know, throw something in the ocean to make us feel better. But you don't, it, the ocean's so vast and you don't even know, almost don't even know where to start. But yeah. with technology, hopefully we'll we'll get there sooner. Yeah, well, like I said, I have my theory, but that does not mean at all that it's what... Other people of family members or um, the uh, people in the aviation industry might think, but we'll get deeper into the pilot's life in the second episode as well. Uh -huh. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. The state-owned Malaysia Airlines was not having a good 2014, even though it was only March. Forced to compete with the larger, more prestigious airlines in Asia, including Emirates, Qatar, and Air Asia, its older fleet was garnering increasingly empty seats. Ticket sales were down, and the airline had lost money for the prior three years, according to CNN aviation correspondent Richard Quest's book, The Vanishing of Flight MH370. MH370 was a red eye flight, taking passengers from the capital city of Kuala Lumpur to its destination in Beijing, China, with a planned arrival time of 6.30 a.m. local time. Malaysia was positioning itself as a business hub of the region, with its country-owned airline operating this flight, eager to tap into the growing business traveler economy in the area as a transfer hub. And, you know, a lot of times in these situations, you have like this eerie, uh, kind of coincidence that Richard Quest had been there two weeks earlier shooting mm -hmm. something for CNN's Business Insider, and they had shot an entire episode about going using Malaysia, using Kuala Lumpur as a business hub that he said they eventually, I mean, the footage wasn't done two weeks later when this happened, and he's like, we had to shelve the footage because... Yeah. It's literally walking with these pilots, not uh, the main pilot of this flight, but the in co the cockpit. Yeah, just like in the cockpit, hands on. And you just go, I didn't even you. It's just it's just a strange coincidence. It is, especially for him to think, wow, if I had done this two weeks later, yeah. you know, and perhaps even taken this flight as an example. But to be in the cockpit of a plane that two weeks later goes missing is very eerie and um you know even though it gets shelved it is something that maybe you can go back and it can provide some sort of insight or you know a clue mm -hmm. the captain was 53 year old zahari ahmad shah 
With over 8,000 flight hours in the Boeing 777 and over 18,000 total flight hours in his career, Shaw was the senior pilot on board. He had started at Malaysian Airlines in 1981 and was a well-respected crew member. He was pilot in command for MH370. Shaw was married to Faiza Khanum, and the pair had two children. Their marriage suffered some, with Shaw publicly fixated on young models, one of whom had barely turned 18. In the 12 months before the flight, Shaw left nearly 100 messages on the women's public Facebook pages, with phrases asking when the young women would be in Kuala Lumpur next and commenting on their bodies and attire. Another colleague told the New Zealand Herald that Shaw often had affairs with other crew members, telling the outlet, Zahari's marriage was bad. In the past, he slept with some of the flight attendants. And so what? We all do. You're flying all over the world with these beautiful girls in the back. But his wife knew. Don't love that quote. No, I mean, it is like from the aviation professionals I've known, it's not the number one thing that always happens always, but it's kind of like that joke of like, Mm -hmm. oh, you know, the pilots are hooking up everywhere they go or they hook up with the flight attendants in the back. But There are definitely stereotypes surrounding pilots and uh, not across the world and all airlines. And one of them is, yeah, that they get around and... um, even if they even if they are married, but um, just because your wife knows doesn't mean that it's all fun and dandy. Yeah, like oh, she knows and it's fine. Also, the it was odd to me. It was both in Ian Higgins' book and in a couple of articles, like these public cringy comments that he was leaving on. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the actions of a cringy fifty three year old man being like, "Ooh, did you just get out of the shower? Yeah, Looks so she's hot. in a robe and she's yeah. like, just get out of the shower. When are you coming to KL? Coming mm-hmm. to KL soon? Like, it." What what are these for? Who are these yeah. for? You know, like, what's your intention behind this? And she's barely of age. Yeah, it's just, it's not a good look. But it's nope. also like, it's not to say it's, he did anything with those models, but like the willingness to, I mean, you're married. That's disrespectful to your wife, yeah. in my opinion. But And he has children that are older than the girls he was reaching out to. Yikes. Which always leaves a sick feeling in my stomach. Mm-hmm. She may have known, but Faiza did not approve. She had begged her husband to attend marriage counseling, but he refused. In the weeks before the flight, Shaw had pulled away, according to his wife, who told investigators, He just retreated into a shell. She said he spent hours alone in a room with the at-home flight simulator he had built himself. His daughter later told investigators that the last conversation she had with her dad was odd. He wasn't the father I knew. He seemed disturbed and lost in a world of his own. Yep. I mean, this is, I think, sadly, I think the writing was on the wall several weeks before anything happened. And hindsight is twenty twenty. And if they could go back and perhaps say something then, but the retreating into a shell, he had built a flight simulator himself at home. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, maybe you just want to practice. Yeah. I mean, that's we'll not get unusual. into, um, some things that you're, you can't practice when you're in real training that he was practicing in his DIY one. Yeah. That you would want to have that at home and have access to it. And I think it's totally normal for a pilot to have an at-home flight simulator, but if your family's like, you're doing nothing but spending hours mm-hmm. and hours in there. Do like, what are you doing in there and why? Yeah. And that's just it's like a depression thing of like, if you're neglecting your family for anything, mm-hmm. that's nerve wracking. It's you, like you said, the writing's on the wall of like, why would you do that? Yeah. Shaw was also politically involved, supporting Malaysian opposition figure Anwar Ibrahim. The day MH370 took off, Ibrahim was convicted for sodomy in a Malaysian courtroom an allegation that most of his supporters agreed was politically motivated. Ibrahim was intent on defeating Malaysia's authoritarian regime, and Shah was called a fervent and strident supporter of Ibrahim, according to Slate. Other online footprints show Shah as a friendly guy, with one video featuring him conducting a YouTube tutorial on how to seal your windows to prevent leaks. 
And that was the question folks had was like, was Shaw at that trial? There was some suggestions that he was there because he wasn't at work yet. Others say that he was not. And that was just a rumor that was started after. But that article in Slate, which is um, connected in the show notes, he was just really passionate about it. Um, and a lot of people were really passionate. This Apparently, Anwar Ibrahim was a really uh, a, attractive figure. Like people were like, oh, my mm-hmm. gosh, we love him. We want to support him. So I think again, people would point to and go, oh man, was he like a little too political? But um, it was just a factor of who he was. And he had met some people um, in his political uh, doings that he maybe had had an affair with one of the women, or at least had a a too close relationship that again, all kind of came out afterwards. But that was something that the timing was just odd that that happened that same day that the flight went missing. Yeah. He was very vocal on Twitter at Twitter at the time um, of his political leanings as well. And Mm -hmm. I mean, tweeted a lot that were, uh, you know, anti uh, the side he was against and pro the side he was for. And it's always a bit dangerous if you are that vocal and you work in an area that um, has ties to the government. And, you know, I mean, a pilot is a pretty powerful position to have. You have a lot of uh, capabilities just from being having access to a plane that a lot of people don't. True. But yeah, it was it's it's funny to see the kind of three people he was online of like this really po- like politics related, like passionately tweeting models like, hey, what are you wearing? Yeah. And then I'm going to show you how to fix your window, guys. Welcome to my YouTube channel. And it's just like, OK, well, we contain multitudes, I guess. Yeah, he had a lot of different sides to him. Sitting in the right seat next to Shaw was first officer Farik Abdul Hamid, a relatively young pilot. The 27-year-old had over 2,700 total flying hours, but was new to the Boeing 777. He had 39 hours in the wide-body jet. An MH370 was his first flight in a 777 without a third pilot to supervise him. Having met Hamid two weeks before the final flight on a different assignment, CNN's Richard Quest called him a charming, unassuming young pilot who was excited to be cut loose on a 777. The large plane meant better assignment for Hamid, allowing him to fly to more exotic and further destinations. And that's what he told Quest those two weeks before of like, I'm so excited. I'm going to get to go to like Australia and like not kind of have to do commuter flights back and forth. But the it's a promotion. Yeah, for sure. It's one to be excited about. I mean, that pilots, you know, their whole career leveling, Mm -hmm. trying to level up to get the big planes and be the one in the left seat. And Mm -hmm. it's. It's really sad that he was so excited about this, and this was kind of like a milestone to launch him into the next part of his career, and it was cut so short. Yeah, and definitely a uh, f- actual literal power imbalance in that you have to yeah. listen to everything. You're, you know, you're the first officer, so the pilot in command. You listen to what they say, and this being like a check ride of like it's your first go without a third pilot to supervise. So you're going to get a report written from this person in the left seat. Um, so yes, sir. No, sir. I'm going to do what you say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if the, uh, pilot in command tells you to leave the cockpit and go do something or go check on something, like you're not going to question it. You're just going to go do it. Mm-hmm, exactly. On March 8th, 2014, MH 370 boarded at Kuala Lumpur international airport. It loaded up with a total of 239 people on board comprised of 227 passengers and 12 crew, including the pilots. The jet could hold up to 282 passengers, so passengers were able to spread out a bit. Four of the ticketed passengers did not show up at check-in and were not on board. Unbeknownst to crew, two of the passengers were traveling on stolen passports. Sliding doors moment that you just happened to miss your flight. And not that show day. up for this. And right or safe. on the other hand, you stole some passports and this was the flight that you chose to fly on with those. Right. It's just all that you can't even know to plan mm-hmm. it or to plan against it. It's such a yep. freak thing. And it, it ended up, you know, those two passports, we can talk about it in part two as well. But that's a one of the early things of 
what's uh what's going on with the airport here like there's some things that are getting like some swiss cheese areas here yeah. that we've missed that some something like falling through the cracks yeah a stolen passport should be they, you catch them as they give it to you mm-hmm. so how was this not caught but that's you know at the time the flight crew can just go okay you have your ticket the security lets you in you must be fine hop right mm-hmm. on those who boarded made up an internationally diverse group over two-thirds of the passengers were chinese A fifth of those on board were Malaysian, and there were a handful of passengers from Indonesia, India, France, the United States, Canada, Iran, New Zealand, Ukraine, and one passenger each from Hong Kong, the Netherlands, Russia, and Taiwan. Truly just showing Kuala Lumpur is like the hub that it was. And like yeah. the reasoning for the passengers, you'll hear them say like, we were from Australia, but he was on this uh, long-term assignment in Beijing. So he had to connect through Kuala Lumpur. Another one's like, I lived in Malaysia and then I had to go to Beijing. So my wife was coming to visit me. It's just, we were on a trip, a, like a bucket list trip. people on their honeymoon. Trip. Yeah, a honeymoon, headed back a bucket to list. young sons at home. Yeah, just all kinds. Like it's every reason you could be on a plane. There was yeah. somebody there from that group. It was a melting pot for sure. The red eye pushed back from the gate at 27 minutes past midnight, local Malaysian time. The pilots pressed the throttle and took off at 12.41 a.m. With its destination set for Beijing, the plane flew along predetermined routes in the sky. These routes, like invisible highways, keep air traffic safe and are marked by waypoints, coordinates in the sky that determine which country's air traffic control or ATC, should take over monitoring a flight. The flight headed toward its first waypoint, Igari, located in the ocean between Malaysia and Vietnam, near the confluence of the South China Sea and the Gulf of Thailand. I didn't know about any of this whenever I first took flying lessons with Tim, my old boss, but I was like, how do planes not just run into each other? And he was like, they plan it in advance. There's a lot of planning and they know if you're going from Dallas to LAX, there's Mm -hmm. a certain, you don't just get up and go, I don't know. I'm kind of feeling this. He's like, you know what level ATC keeps an eye on it. So nobody's crashing into each other. You have this and you program it into the the flight. So you take Mm -hmm. off and then you hit go and it's going to keep you on an extremely smooth and precise track right to where you need to go. Yeah. The plane does most of it. And if it starts getting uh, jerky or goes way off course, it's as we'll see, usually a manual operation. The plane is not programmed to do stuff like that unless something Mm -hmm. like horribly goes wrong with the system and it, and it fails. But it is interesting to think, we can't see, you know, the market, mm-hmm. the lanes in the sky, but mm-hmm. they do exist there. And that someone, you know, had to map all of those paths from one place to the next. And I mean, it took somebody being the first person to do it. And then, you know, I'm sure there's multiple ways in case there's multiple aircrafts in the sky. But it is um, it's a different world up there. For sure. Right. Well, and it's also a pretty straight shot from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing, Mm -hmm. pretty much north, northeast, direct, like just right over the South China Sea, just straight up there. And so it's not like there's a lot of, you know, we got to go up and then make a right and then go up more and then make a left. And I mean, it's just one straight shot up Mm -hmm. past Waypoint Igari. Seemed like a pretty um, just uh, everyday mundane flight that you Mm -hmm. just, you know, not a lot to it. ATC instructed the flight to head toward waypoint Igari and climb to an altitude of 35,000 feet. When planes are in flight, various data transmitters connect with satellite and ground destinations. One is the ACAR system, which stands for the Aircraft Communications and Reporting System. This data communication system provides information on the speed, altitude, and performance of the craft, as well as the amount of fuel remaining. MH370's ACARS transmission showed that it had an excess of fuel on board, an amount that Captain Shaw had ordered before takeoff. It was enough for the plane to fly two hours longer than its scheduled flight time. MH370's last transmission via ACARS occurred at 1.07 a.m. That's the well, discretion of the pilot. It would... It would um, Potentially be a red flag, I would think, if the pilot ordered 
unless that's common practice, just in case something goes wrong to order extra fuel. But I mean, that's weight that you have to take into consideration for the plane. Mm -hmm. And whoever is approving those orders, would you not question, like, why is this needed? I mean, at the time, the guy who's hooking up the gas pump to the, you know, the jet fuel pump up to the jet says, all right, boss, you know, I'm here yeah. to pump the, the jet fuel in. How much do you want? And what do you want me to write down? You know, you're going here. It should be X thousands of, it's like 96,000 gallons or something. It's like a huge amount because it's a huge plane that sucks mm -hmm. a lot of jet fuel up. But I, I think it's a lot of stuff in retrospect of like, oh, well, we should like say if it's any more than X percent more, we got to ask why. You got to get a supervisor to sign off. But at the time it was load a little bit of extra oxygen in the cockpit for the pilots and the ground crew said, oh, oh okay. And then also, hey, load a couple of a thousand gallons more of jet fuel in here. And the ground crew went, oh, okay. Yeah. It's also midnight. You know, you take that into consideration. Everybody's late and tired. And maybe the one of the last flights that's going out or, you True. know, even if it's not, you're like, yeah, you just want to get these people going. It's a late flight. Let's sure, sure, sure. Whatever. Yeah. And that might also be, um, if you know that as the pilot, it might, you might know that, okay, of all the flights that I might be able to get away with this on and no questions are asked. It could be one that is at midnight where people aren't like, you know, we hope they're paying attention to all flights equally because Certainly. I don't want to have to only fly at like 10 a.m. to make sure yeah. that I'm getting everybody at their best game. But yeah, yeah it is it is very much uh, in hindsight, these things stick out. But at the time, for whatever reason, they didn't. Right. You're like, oh, maybe he knows something I don't. He's the mm -hmm. captain. I'm not. OK, sure. You have. And I believe under the Malaysian airline policy, and it might be it was all airlines and I'm assuming has changed, but it was not a it was a strange thing that he did it, but it wasn't against policy. So everybody was like, sounds good, boss. We'll do. Yeah. And you never want to be the person to question the boss, especially mm -hmm. if. You're, you know, several rungs down from him, perhaps, and he's been there for a long time, very well exactly. respected. You don't want to, like, come across as being subordinate. And he's well known within Malaysian Airlines of, like, he's been here since the 80s. Mm -hmm. He's, like, everybody's favorite. He's a mentor to people. You know, he, he's fine. He's, like, above yeah. suspicion almost. Mm -hmm. At this time, Captain Shaw got on the radio and confirmed the flight altitude of 35,000 feet. A few moments later, the plane was handed off from Malaysian ATC to Vietnam, with the radio instructing Shaw, Contact HCM, for Ho Chi Minh, and included the radio frequency. Captain Shaw replied, Good night, Malaysian 370. These would be the last words recorded from the flight. It was 1.19 a.m. Three minutes later at 1.21 a.m., the plane was near its assigned navigational waypoint, when its transponder was turned off. This piece of equipment is used to transmit the flight's location to ATC and is the main identifier for civilian aircraft. It is not protocol to shut off this device in an otherwise normal flight. Once the switch was flipped, MH370 disappeared from civilian air traffic control radar. This is a huge red flag that yeah. uh, absent... It would be an extreme circumstance. You pretty much would a never want to take over. Somebody yes. storming the cockpit and demanding you do it would be. The cockpit blows out because yeah. of an oxygen fire yeah. or something like that, where it's just like it's the system shuts down. This is not even close to protocol ever because yeah. the, you want to be able to be seen by civilian ATC because they're the ones telling you, hey, where to go, what to do. If something, you know, a military exercise happens in the middle of your flight, you want your ATC to go, hey, this thing is happening or this other flight has an emergency. We need you to get out of the way. You need to be seen. That's a yeah. big part of it is to be seen. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be seen. A responsibility for your aircraft, but also the people on the ground and down. I mean, if you're not showing up on radar and somebody sees you flying and they're like, what is this? This looks suspicious. And all of a sudden you get shot down because you turned your thing off and you're not on their radar. Like, you're putting everybody in danger by turning yeah. that off. Or just like other planes flying in that yeah. area and go, oh, well, not ATC, am I clear? And they're like, you're clear to go. And mm -hmm. you're going to cause a midair collision. Ra military radar is like a separate thing. But for the civilian, just to keep planes from literally, that's why I asked him, I was like, how do planes not just smash into each other? He's like, there are people watching them. And I'm like, yeah. oh, well, they can't watch you if you go invisible. No, they can't. 
Sinisterhood will be right back. Well, I'm trying to save money right now, as so Mm -hmm. many of us are. So I'm having to cut back on salon pedicures. But you know what's great about that? I've got the whole Olive and June pedicure kit at home. And I got to say, with the poppy, I'm pretty good. I'm almost as good as salon. But more than that, it's so much easier. Because if it's like 1 a.m. and I'm like, okay, well, now's the time that I can do this. My salon, as much as I want them to be open whenever I need them to be, they're not open at 1 a.m. So (laughs) it's on my time, which makes it very convenient. Right. And you just feel better with your hands manicured, your toes manicured. And to have it, no matter what system it is, all at home is such a game changer. Olive and June nail polishes last seven plus days and they do not chip. Their Manny system is the ultimate secret behind salon perfect nails at home. And they also have one specifically dedicated for pedicures. They are both all in one, no guessing, no messy nails, no salon price tag. It's all in one box. Yeah, anytime you try to paint your nails at home, at least anytime I try to paint my nails at home, it looks like a child did it, and I don't have a child. It's just me (laughs) trying my best, struggling. But like you mentioned it already with that poppy, the patented handle Mm -hmm. for your brush, with your non-dominant hand, no matter what you're painting, it always comes out perfect every time. And the color selection of Olive and June stays impeccable. Every season, they've got a new set, and every season, I'm like, I need that, but I don't have any more space for it because I want one of everything. My wall looks like a salon wall because I love Olive and June polishes. I've never counted how many colors they have available, but if I had to throw out a number, I'm going to say upwards of 1,000. There there are so many colors that they have. Yes, truly anything you could want. They're always like the most trendy ones too. So Mm -hmm. that's why I love it. We suggest trying the Olive and June Manny system with six polishes. It breaks down to just $2 a Manny. So like Christy said, you're trying to save money. We all are. You can spend $35 for one gel manicure. And this way you get six different colors to choose from. Mm -hmm. Getting beautiful salon perfect nails at home is now a dream come true with Olive and June. No more having to make appointments or travel to a salon banging on the door at 1 a.m. They even open. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> answering me. <laughs> Visit oliveandjune.com slash creepy for 20% off your first Manny system. That's O-L-I-V-E-A-N-D-J-U-N-E dot com slash C-R-E-E-P-Y for 20% off your first Manny system. At 1.25 a.m., MH370 was picked up by military radar. The path that flew next deviated greatly from its flight plan. Flight plans are programmed into the aircraft before takeoff. In order to deviate, the plane must have been flown manually by someone in the cockpit. When the flight path was later plotted, its slightly jagged flight lines indicated manual operation. Even so, the path was neatly aligned, which indicated a highly skilled pilot behind the controls. The plane turned southwest back across the Malay Peninsula in Malaysia. And that's the crazy part is to watch it, you know, where you see just a jet line whenever something's in autopilot and the slightly rickety one that this shows on radar. But also it's going straight to its destination and then just does a complete 180 and jet and makes a huge sharp left turn back over across the ocean. And you're like, why would any why would anybody do that of their own accord unless they were like being forced to do that why would someone do that exactly it's not you're not headed to beijing anymore you're headed the opposite direction of your destination Mm -hmm. and also back over the land that you just left when you Mm -hmm. were expected to go north to go to beijing why did you turn back the other way and then it and again having atc not having made contact and then also radio contact but then also no longer seeing it on there the military doesn't know. They're like, they're literally not monitoring that whatsoever. They're looking and going, oh, look, a commercial jet. Okay, looks normal. They don't know where the commercial jet's supposed to go or where it's not. But it's like, oh, it's flying like along these same highway. So it must be fine. They're mm-hmm. not like red alert. Now, I think in the States, it is a little bit, it would be a little bit more, uh, we're a little more anal retentive, at least as far as like, if you deviate into certain restricted airspace, they'll just scramble fighter jets. And if you're un- non-responsive to ATC for like X amount of minutes, and I think it's a pretty sh- short amount, they'll scramble fighter jets just to go like, what's going on in there? Yeah. And they can fly so close to the plane oh, that they yes. can see if somebody's passed out. So dangerous. Yeah. So skilled. I, I mean, but it's good. We want that because yeah. if I'm on a 
plane and some something has gone wrong, I hope somebody's up there within a matter of minutes to check out what's going on. Mm-hmm. I mean, and just the skills that a fighter jet would have to get mm-hmm. right up close and to be able to fly that close to sea. And Ian Higgins' book talked about that happened in a situation where they call a ghost flight where the cabin is depressurized and everyone's passed out and the jets were able to be scrambled within about 15 minutes and get up there and see there's nobody cog- conscious except a single flight attendant was conscious and was able, then got up in the cockpit, was able to radio, and they were kind of trying to help her land it, I believe. And it did not work, unfortunately, mm. because but you you're at least able to go, oh, OK, everyone's unconscious. We can we get some kind of an answer <sighs> that made my stomach turn thinking yeah, about the terror of being that flight attendant. My walks have been Take dark me. as fuck lately because I'm just listening to that book in my head. <laughs> no, I, yeah, it's, it's dark. Uh, you you've always had um, an interest in black box recordings and like last oh, yeah. messages from pilots and that kind of stuff. It sticks with me. It haunts me in a way that I, it, it's doesn't feel good. So I tend to avoid those, but yeah, I mean, you go over uh 35,000 feet, like up to 40,000 feet, that cabin depressurizes. And what I didn't know, and perhaps I'm naive is that the oxygen masks that deploy on a, Flight, if you need them, only have enough oxygen for 15 minutes. They are not yeah. there to keep you alive. It's just there to keep you alive enough while the pilot descends back because that's what they assume the pilot would do in the event the masks drop, they're trying to land. So you get down at a level where they're not needed. If a pilot can't or won't descend, then um, after 15 minutes, you just suffocate and die. Yeah. The uh, I did not know that. I thought the masks were indefinite. <laughs> indefinite no. oxygen, which is a stupid thing in hindsight to think. It's not stupid at all because you think, oh, that that's there to keep us alive. But yeah, yeah you're right. I think because of weight and stuff like that, you're and space on the plane and things, you gotta go, well, how long would it really take if you had an emergency and it caused this depressurization? How long would it take a pilot to navigate to somewhere Say you know to safely land, even if it's a miracle on the Hudson situation, and you're like, we don't even have land we can land in. We mm-hmm. got to be able to float this bitch. Then you would say about 15 minutes. But you're right. If there was a, a hijacking situation or something like that, and you had knowledge of the the timing, you'd be like, I really only have to wait this out for 15 minutes. The mm-hmm. I did not know until I actually just saw a video, and I'll make sure it's in the show notes, of a person who is in a flight who is up at the high level where in a depressurized cabin in the military, and they're supposed to be wearing their oxygen mask, but kind of as an experiment, takes it off. And the feeling and the what happens in this epoxy, I think is the word for it, of mm-hmm. when you get such lack of oxygen, you really kind of become drunk feeling, a little Mm -hmm. bit giddy, almost like you don't care. I think a famous uh, hot air balloonist too, they had oxygen on board and they got up so high that they needed it and then it eventually ran out and then he later did come down and lived. But he said, boy, in those moments up there, I just was like, I don't care if I die. This is great. This view is fantastic. And he said he was freaked out when he came back down that he's like, God, I can't believe I felt that way. But Mm -hmm. he said it was strange. This this like euphoria almost and just like a warm uh, apathy almost of like, Mm -hmm. this is fine. Which the only positive perhaps one can take from that is if your loved ones or you are in a situation where that happens, at least it was a pretty peaceful way to go. Yeah, it would be. Absent the terror you would feel when (laughs) the um, masks drop and you're like, what the hell is going on? But if you're assured everything's okay and it's just, you know, and you put the masks on, but then 20 minutes later, it's a moot point. Yeah, you might just be asleep and not even Mm -hmm. care that you were. Over the next hour, the plane continued flying on the edge between Malaysian and Vietnamese airspace, perhaps on purpose to cause confusion. The plane had disappeared from radar, and protocol required follow-up if a plane had not been heard from within five minutes. It took 16 minutes for the Vietnamese ATC to attempt to contact the plane. The Malaysian controller, Siti Sarah, later told newspapers that in 18 years on the job, she had never seen a plane disappear from radar, though she and other controllers did not do much about it. 
One message sent to MH370 via ACARS around 1.22 a.m. said simply, Please contact Ho Chi Minh ATC ASAP. They complain they cannot track you on their radar. The message was not received. So it's the pilots, if it's the onus is on the pilot when you're being handed off from one ATC to the other to then turn your frequency to that ATC, which was like 129.5 or whatever, and they told him what it was, to then say, Malaysia 370, come in, Ho Chi, HCM, Ho Chi Minh ATC, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Just keep flying how I'm flying. But he never called in. And within five minutes, they really should have been like, hey, yeah. where it, in, in MH370, where are you at? But they mm-hmm. didn't say anything. And No, 16 minutes. And then Three times you're going, the amount that they should have waited. Not even are you not even, you're not being seen on their radar because you turn the transponder off. But for the military purposes, you're like right on the edge. And it's, they know by, based on the military blip that it's a Malaysian plane. So Vietnamese, even if the Vietnamese military saw it, they're like, oh, this is, that's a, a Malaysian plane. It's fine. They're they're just flying in their own airspace. Mm-hmm. We don't have to muck with it. So it's a pretty genius route to fly if you wanted kind of a who's on first situation of ATCs contacting you and then also of militaries going, ah, we're not really going to worry about it. Yeah. Literally being able to kind of fly under the radar and it would take a very skilled pilot that knew of these things to uh, kind of plan that out. Mm-hmm. In the first hour after it disappeared from radar, Malaysian and Vietnamese ATC exchanged 14 messages with one another regarding the location of the missing aircraft. Meanwhile, MH370 was on its new course. An hour after it deviated from the flight plan, around 2.25 a.m., the plane had flown northwest above the Strait of Malacca. It then made a sharp left turn, heading south in what investigators later termed The final major turn. Investigators determined this sharp of a turn is not possible with autopilot and was instead completed manually. A sharper angle than is allowed by autopilot, the turn dipped the plane's left wing for nearly two solid minutes. Heading south, the only data received from MH370 after that was via so-called heartbeat signals picked up by military satellites. And they said it will it would have thrown you from one side of the plane to the other how deep this turn was. It was like three yeah. degrees sharper than the sharpest turn allowed. Also, tariff, if if at this point these people are alive, it's terrifying and you know something horrible is happening. Like you're like, you can look out the window and realize, what are we doing? We are not headed where we're going anymore. We are headed back out over the ocean. Yeah. And that dip, dip, that super sharp turn, you're like, are we trying to avoid something or are we being chased? Because there's no need for a plane to turn that sharply at all. Yeah. The plane should have sent ACARS signals every half hour, but none were sent after the transponder was switched off at 107 a.m. Around the time of the final major turn, one Malaysian operator said it received a signal from MH370 in Cambodia, which quieted the concern until 15 minutes later, when the controllers realized the flight's plan did not include a path through the country. ATC continued exchanging messages. Controllers from Cambodia, China, and Singapore were all contacted as well, with none having seen or heard from the airplane. And you can get down into the weeds with this, like in some of the data that was released afterwards of like, multiple times an hour, it was like, have you seen them? No. What about you? No. Hmm. Okay. Well, let us know if you see anything. And then 15 minutes later, okay, what about now? Have you seen anything? And it's like, no, not yet. And I'm like, go wake somebody up. Fucking long. Are you going to wait till you fly another plane up there and see what the hell's going on? Try to find some, I mean, it's, it's a very time sensitive situation and it seems like you've reached all of the most dangerous scenarios. They're right. off radar. You know they turn the transponder off and you can't contact them and they aren't can't contacting you. So none of this looks good. So now you got to get up there and see like why is this happening? Yeah, it's and this is just a civilian ATC, but that still would be a you need to call your boss, to call yeah. the director who then can call the military and say, mm-hmm. "Hey, we need somebody to go up there and look what's happening." But I I did read that the Malaysian air traffic control was at about 50% capacity like they should have had 
twice as many people working as they did mm. just because they didn't have, you know, people, you know, just they didn't have either the funding to fund it or they didn't have qualified people to do it. But they had, you know, you're running at 50 percent capacity. You probably are like, oh, Vietnam's got it. I'll check back in 30 minutes. I have 15 other planes I need to be looking at. I can't be worrying about this one single, not knowing the gravity of the situation yeah. at the time. You're, But at some point, tell a boss, man, raise a flag. Yeah, I think for a little bit, you might be able to chalk it up to, this is probably just a system error or a fluke or something. But at some point when it's been hours and multiple countries are involved, it's it's starting to look like worst case scenario and you can't just keep passing the buck. Right. So it's like, well, I don't want to piss anybody off by waking him up or I, I piss somebody off yeah. if it means at least knowing where this aircraft is or being able to intercept it. If it was, God forbid, uh, something like a 9-11 situation yeah. where they're they're planning on taking it somewhere to harm even more people than just those on board of like, you've got to err. This is not like this was in the 80s. That this, mm -hmm. you know, this is 2014. You've got to err on the side of we don't know if somebody has breached the cockpit and what their intentions are. Yeah, it's it's. Because it is post 9-11, it makes it even more wild to me that people weren't up there much faster seeing what was happening. Mm -hmm. ATCs did not contact the military, who was actually able to see the flight on its radar systems at the time. The plane continued making handshake contact with military satellites as it flew south into the Indian Ocean, way off its original course, and headed to no apparent destination. MH370 did still follow the pre-designated commercial flight routes in the sky, meaning military aircraft would not clock it as hostile. Later, the Prime Minister of Malaysia said a man was monitoring the military radar and told CNN he did not send up military jets. Because it was deemed not to be hostile, it behaved like a commercial airline following a normal flight plan. What we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> Uh, it's in the worst way possible. And again, I think uh, an experienced pilot would know these things, would oh, know certainly. that, you know, know enough to be like not get picked up on certain raiders, but also know enough to not get shot down or be questioned because you are still flying the same routes that you normally do. So you're, you're towing the, you're towing like the perfect line between looking suspicious and just like kind of curious. Right. And maybe if you knew that air traffic control was understaffed and like, they're very unlikely to contact the military and the military is not likely to scramble jets because you're, it's like you stole a car and you're driving it the speed limit you're driving it the opposite direction on the highway you're supposed to go on, but you're going the speed limit. Yeah. You're not really using your blinker, but there's nobody really paying attention that much. But if you were doing something totally off road or, you know, going super fast or whatever, you might get a little, you know, you might be on someone's radar. But in this case, it was like perfect little, yeah. just following the perfect little line. It, it seems to me intentionally doing things to minimize your, uh, the suspicious look. To evade detection, yeah. Yeah, certainly. yeah, evade detection is a good way to put it. When family members arrived at the airport in the morning to greet their loved ones, the information boards first stated the flight was delayed, then canceled, then all information was removed from the boards. As Rudin Abdul Rahman was the Director General of the Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia, he was sleeping with his phone off when the plane went missing. He woke around 2.30 a.m. for his early prayers and checked his phone. It was full of alerts from his subordinates regarding the non-responsive plane. He told CNA Insider that he felt jolted by the news, wondering whether the plane had crashed. Yeah, he's like, I like to be offline, you know, like at night. And then whenever I turned my phone on, it was just bombarded. You got to have a second person then that yeah. if, if, and I get it, you want to have family time and not be bothered. Disconnect at night. But some positions require 24-7 um, being able to get a hold of somebody. Maybe it's not you. Maybe yeah. it's somebody above you. But it can't just be, well, we got to wait till they get here in the morning yeah. with th something like this. You got to have but someone that you can get a hold of right away that can make an executive decision. Right. Or have like a... If it's a big deal, like a plane is fucking missing, call my house phone. It's fine. Call my wife. 
she can wake me up. You yeah. Know? Send somebody, somebody go over to his house. You probably yeah. know where he lives. Go knock just, on the door. <laughs> just wake his ass up. Mm-hmm. I mean, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was, this is just what he was doing. Yeah. But you, you start to see like the protocol wise of like, maybe even he doesn't need to be looped in is that you immediately call the military and they can decide what to do, you know? Yeah. But I always think it's better to err on the side of caution in every situation, because I would rather be apologizing for waking somebody up and causing a big fuss over nothing than having to explain to family members at the airport. I'm sorry. We just, we don't know where it is. And that's literally what they're like going to the gate agents. Like, where's the, why is our family not here? And they're like, I don't know. We, we asked they, they they're not coming in and it's like, they should have been here already. And it's like, yeah, yeah it's a good point. They should have, I don't know. Horrifying. Yeah. Raman's first question was why the Vietnamese ATC didn't make contact with the plane. ATC simply told him they were unable to make contact. Raman sprung into action, attempting to put together as much information as possible. The information from ATC showed a startling lack of action. Up until just moments before the plane was to land, there was back and forth discussion from Vietnamese and Malaysian ATC neither of whom had heard from the plane for hours and neither of whom had called for an immediate search and rescue. And Chinese ATC would not have known to call for them because the plane's not in there, not even yeah. close to their airspace. So they should have gotten the handoff from Vietnam or another, con- you know, where how, whatever the route was. But they're not worried about it because they know that they have a scheduled flight and they haven't seen it. But if they call and go, hey, where is it? Well, we're not really sure. We'll, we'll keep looking. Let us know if you see it. It's like, what do you mean? Let us know if you, we see it. A startling lack of action is putting it mildly. I mean, I... I don't think any of it was malicious or they, you know, I think it was human error and just assuming that it was all just probably a fluke and somebody else would take care of it. But you can't do that. You can't be a bystander and just hope somebody else is going to figure it out. If you realize you haven't spoken or heard from this plane in hours, that is it's goes completely against the norm and you got to take it up the flagpole to whoever the highest person is to to get it taken care of figure out what's going on it's truly it's that first like you said it's not malicious but it's that first it's been more than five minutes and you wait until it's 16 minutes late to even try to contact it and then when it's radio silence that's when it's like you got to get up there and figure out what's going on but instead it was just these i think probably uh, stressed, overworked people going, well, I don't, I really don't know what to do. And I have all these other planes and they're answering. So I'm just going to go do that. And you just realize you cannot operate and a system of air traffic control that way. It is too dangerous. Why put all these protocols and rules in place of what to do? And like, if we haven't heard from them by this point, then we need to do this because something's wrong. What's the point of having all that stuff in place if you're not going to follow it? Yeah, exactly. It's like, and the reason why it's in place is for situations, unfathomable situations like this. Yeah. And then when the rubber meets the road, it's like, that's exactly what we should have done. And we did nothing. Mm -hmm. Frantic families at the Beijing airport began scrambling for information. An hour after the plane was supposed to land, Malaysian Airlines finally released a statement reading, Malaysia Airlines confirms that flight MH370 has lost contact with Subang Air Traffic Control at 2.40 a.m. today, March 8. The release confirmed that the flight departed at 12.41 a.m. and was due to land at 6.30 a.m. that same day. At the time of this press release, Malaysian authorities were not aware of the plane's unusual U-turn move. All they knew was the plane's last whereabouts when its transponder was shut off just moments after its final radio call. Based on the plane's location at the time of lost contact, initial estimates were that the plane had gone down somewhere in the Gulf of Thailand, between Malaysia and Vietnam. Rescue crews began searching on March 9th, between the two waypoints that the flight should have passed by. Within 12 hours of searching, reports indicated debris was found. The loss of the flight began a roller coaster of emotions for the crew and passengers next of kin, who would be given hope with false reports just to have their hope dashed when officials released new information. That initial debris and other reports of supposed oil slicks in the search area were ruled out as not belonging to the same type of aircraft as MH370. 
However, it became apparent that the Malaysian authorities had more information than they were willing to reveal. On March 8th at 10.30 p.m., the military had alerted those in charge of the search that they had picked up an unknown civilian aircraft on their radar during the time in which MH370 would have been flying. The government did not make this information public at the time. This is just where you see those early moments of even waiting an hour to tell the family that their loved ones were missing, despite having knowledge as of whenever the transponder was turned off at 1.30 a.m., 1.20 a.m., that the gaps start to get filled in with either questions or conspiracies, or mm-hmm. which you can't blame somebody if you have no answers. You want to have an answer. But it starts to really early on erode the trust in the Malaysian authorities, kind of not saying things or saying things in a certain way. Mm-hmm. If you're not getting answers, I'm the family. I'm not getting answers. And I know that those answers could have been given to me and were kept back. I would think it was sus and that there was something was trying to be covered up. Like, what else are you hiding? You hid that from us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The military radar revealed the plane's odd route, showing the U-turn the plane made to fly back over the landmass of Malaysia before making its final turn into the Straits of Malacca in the Bay of Bengal. On March 10th, over 60 hours after the plane had gone missing, Civil Aviation Director Rahman released a statement saying, We also conducted a search in areas north of the Straits of Malacca, as we do not want to discount the possibilities of the aircraft turn back to the Straits of Malacca. This was the first public mention of a turn back, leaving journalists covering the story, and worse, family members worried about their loved ones, to wonder what exactly that phrase meant. CNN aviation correspondent Richard Quest described Malaysian authorities as slipping that information into a briefing rather than calling attention to it as a reason why their search area went from the northeastern coast of Malaysia all the way to the northwest, western, and southwestern coasts. You can't just slip something like that in. That's You feel gaslit. You're like, wait a second, what? Did I hear that right? Why? If that's... That sounds like a big deal, but they're not presenting it as a big deal. So am I overreacting? Like most people wouldn't have any knowledge of like how planes are supposed to go and what's weird and what's not. So Mm -hmm. that they did everybody real dirty with that one. No, for sure. And especially because, you know, they had at least shown the flight trajectory of where it should have gone. And then they did reveal to the families, you know, we lost contact here near Waypoint Agari. So then we're going to search this whole area to the east of that, which is a big open part of ocean in the South China Sea. So you're the family sitting there going, okay, maybe this is it. And then China announced, we found debris, we found an oil slick. You're like, oh my gosh, it crashed. And then they're like, well, it's not really that oil slick. And you're like, it's not oil from a, you know, it wouldn't be from a Boeing 777. You're like, okay, so that's not my family. Well, we found yeah. more debris. <gasps> okay, well, that's not my family. And then just to have be waiting for any scrap of information and a huge piece of information, like it turned back. You're like, turned where? How do you yeah. know this? What? And so at every one of these press conferences, it's heart-wrenching to watch the footage because you see more and more microphones are stacking up on the table in front of them. You know, it was a few at the beginning and then it's like, a mass of microphones in front of them. But worse off is the in the people in the audience is they're clinging to any information about their loved ones and to have it just sort of like, yeah, anyways, this happened. So we're, we're looking. We'll take no questions. Goodbye. You're like, wait, what? Yeah. We've just been hanging our entire hope on the South China Sea. Yeah. It's um, the feeling of helplessness is palpable in, in all of this. It, also, I'm like, if that wasn't the debris from this plane, what was it from? Like, we're just find, finding debris and oil slicks all around the ocean. Like, they had to have come from some aircraft. <laughs> right? I think in some cases, it's uh, it might be a drone, a chunk of satellite, mm. a piece of a boat that fell off. The oil was released by a boat, which I'm like, don't be releasing your shit yeah. in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, but we know they do. Uh, so, or, you know, uh, waste from a boat that from a plane looks like an oil slick and you get down and you're like, oh, no, that they just like release their waste. But to the, I think. The allegation from some of the journalists that covered it and some of the political journalists at the time said that because such a large quantity of the victims on board were Chinese, that the Chinese government was very eager to be the ones that say, hey, we brought these, you know, we brought your family home for you. And so maybe got a little bit excited when they were announcing some fines that shouldn't have been announced to the families Mm -hmm. until they were 
vetted before getting over-eager. everybody's hopes. Yeah, hopes up and down. And then meanwhile, because Malaysia, it was their aircraft, they wanted to kind of be the ones in charge saying, this is where we should and shouldn't search. But it sucks that 60 hours were spent searching in an area where they knew as of 1030 p.m. a couple of days before that plane went over there. Yeah, it's interesting that nobody wanted to be the one to um, take control when they couldn't get in touch with the aircraft. But now Mm -hmm. everybody wants to be the one to take credit for locating it, which includes jumping the gun on giving out information, but also knowingly spending a ton of money and time and resources searching in an area where it's not going to be. Yeah, it's impossible for it to be over there. And like, why? The you know it yeah. can't be there. So like, why is it just to save face? Like, I mean, uh, it seems if that's the reason, it, very wasteful of many things just to try and like show that like, oh, we're trying over here. When you know you're you're trying in the total wrong area. Yeah, and Director Rahman said, or Ra- Director Rahman said later, you know, at the time I I had heard that a civilian aircraft was picked up on military radar, but we didn't 100 percent know, and we had to wait until we could confirm it was MH370. So I didn't want to stop everybody from searching in the South China Sea in case that was where it was. But it's like, what civilian air? I mean, it's armchair quarterback, right? Yeah. Of like, obviously it was MH370. So that was kind of his argument later was like, I didn't want to stop the search over there. So I went ahead and started a search, but there you're still kind of now splitting your resources. Mm-hmm. And one of them is definitely not where it was. Sinisterhood will be right back. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by overpriced wireless providers, we've learned that there's always a catch. So when we heard that Mint Mobile wireless plans are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan, we thought, as we often do because we're cynical, what's the catch? But after talking to them, it all made sense. There is no catch. Mint Mobile's secret is that they sell wireless services online. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly on to all of us. Yes, Mint Mobile is the official wireless provider of Sinisterhood, <laughs> as it is the the wireless provider we use for this? our Sinisterhood specific business phone. I love that so we can nice say we know. have a business phone. Too. Yes, we have a business phone. If you, anyone needs to call me, I've got a cell phone, and it always <laughs> works, and it's super fast, and it is suspiciously cheap. But you have nothing to be suspicious about. That's just Mint Mobile, baby. It works, and it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. All plans include unlimited talk and text, plus high speed data on the nation's largest five. G network. You can use your own phone like we did and phone number and bring over all your existing contacts. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash sinisterhood. That's mintmobile.com slash sinisterhood. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash sinisterhood. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. When questioned on this new information at a follow-up press conference that day, and then Acting Transport Minister Hishamuddin Hussein insisted, We have nothing to hide. As the authorities were being accused of incompetence and outright lying to cover up whatever truly happened to the plane. Families were frustrated that the authorities did not share with the families what radar had indicated in a clear and timely fashion, instead deciding to mention it only in passing during a press conference. The families, in my opinion, on these cases, and really any case when a missing person is involved, I think they should be the first to be updated on everything before it goes to the press, media, or anything. Because so often we've seen in this that the families don't find out until they see it on the news. And that's not how you should be delivered this type of information. No, and to the kind of indignity of like, keep up where you're like, wait, what? This is the first time I heard this. And then to say, we feel like we're not being communicated with and to have the transport minister go, we're not hiding. We have nothing to hide. We didn't do anything. And the government went slightly on the defensive. I mean, fairly, unfairly, they were, they were working with limited disjointed information. I think it just revealed a ton of cracks in the operations of Malaysia Airlines, 
and also the air traffic control over there. And it's, you know, you're a politician at the end of the day. You mm -hmm. want your constituents to have faith in you. And so doing what you can do to minimize going, listen, we have fucked up on several accounts because we should have done this. We should have done this. We should have done this. So you understand they're they're doing that. But at the end of the day, these people's family members are fucking lost. You cannot yeah. try to cover up your own tracks. You have to just take the licks and say, we messed up. We owe you big time. We're sorry. And we will be transparent going forward. But it just seemed like there were so many instances of like, tell them, but not in like a really big way. Cause you don't want to piss them off and freak them out. So just like slip it in there. They say that they weren't doing it that, that way on purpose. And maybe it was just like lack of skill or something, but you're either incompetent or you're lying. So you choose. Yeah. Yeah. Or you're just, um, not properly trained on, I mean, which I guess falls under incompetence, but I, maybe they were holding out hope, like we'll find it, everything will be fine. So we don't want to get everybody in a tizzy before then, but let's be realistic about the situation. You've lost an airplane in the sky mm -hmm. and you haven't heard from them in hours. So I think we're past the point of like, oh, maybe it's just a fluke, but just like yeah. with Jill Dando, her brother found out she'd been murdered on the news at his job. Like yeah. family members shouldn't have to find out stuff like that the same way the rest of us are finding it out. They, they deserve better than that. Yeah. They should not be the last to know. And then what they're told, it should be the, as complete of a picture as possible. Yes. And as they want to know, you know, if, if it's a family member that's like, please don't tell me all that, but it, they're, the, I have not heard that from most of the people, especially the more vocal proponents are like, give me every shred of information. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their lives have been taken over by this because in those early days, they were reliant on the government and saying like, oh, the government won't lie to me. They'll tell me. And then they weren't. So it's like, well, fuck it. I'm going to have to be the one that finds where my wife went. Like we've seen time and time again. Mm -hmm. On March 12th, the Malaysian government held another press conference, at which time the authorities admitted they expanded the search area back on March 8th, given the military radar data. They had started by searching 14,000 square miles in the South China Sea, and then added an additional 12,000 square miles on the other side of the country in the Straits of Malacca, based on the military data. The press went wild with theories, speculating why a plane would make a deliberate move to turn back and fly in the direction it came from. At another press conference on March 15th, the prime minister generated more speculation when he told the crowd that the transponder having been switched off and the strange U-turn charted on military radar were consistent with deliberate action by someone on the plane. Well, this catapults it into a whole new level of what what happened because oh yeah as family you're thinking i i would be thinking terrorist attack somebody breached the cockpit and and took over because i would it i wouldn't it's, it wouldn't occur to me that like oh perhaps one of the pilots did this of their own accord yeah or just and you would you're also thinking as far into the flight as it was and the location of where it was in the sky, statistically, it is likely that it would be some type of an explosion. The, a Boeing did a survey and 61% of crashes happen during either takeoff or landing. 47% is during landing, 14% during takeoff, and only 10% of accidents happen during the cruising part of the flight. And of those, well, not accidents, by that I mean incidents, like to, to completely take the plane down and the 10% of incidents in happening in flight is usually the result of uh, an explosion of something having been planted on the plane or a purposeful takedown or whatever. Um, so you're already probably thinking like it didn't happen during takeoff or landing some, there's probably some intervention. And then you hear the fucking prime minister come on a press conference and be like, I don't want to say it outright, but somebody mm -hmm. did this. And you're like, yeah, what? <laughs> and now the question is who mm -hmm. and, and why? All, and still, where's the plane? Because yes. if I'm family, I feel like if I thought, okay, somebody recharted the plane, hijacked it, took it somewhere, maybe there's still a chance that they're alive because, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they hijacked the plane and landed it in another country. And, you know, I mean, and that, that's why you would, can't find it. Yeah. It would, it would all be wishful thinking. But like we said, their hopes keep getting brought up with little crumbs of information and then dashed by, by something else. But 
you know, you, you know, it blew up. Okay. Well, that's the end of it. You know, you know, it, it crashed into the ocean. That's the end of it. But if you're like, it looks like it got hijacked and we still don't know where it is. Well, I mean, your mind's going a million places, but one of those might be, okay, then there's a chance they're still alive. Yeah, and then they may not be having a great time where they're at, whether they're being held hostage or they're on an island somewhere or whatever, but maybe someday I'll see them again, Mm -hmm. which again is just that continued hopeful dash, hopeful dash, hopeful, and the amount that these folks have been through. And this was only in the first, what, March 15th, the first five, six days of this, the first week was rough already. And it's been 10 years. It was also at a press conference on March 15th when the prime minister noted that the satellite data from Inmarstadt, a British telecommunications company, indicated that the plane kept flying for six hours after the last contact on radar. The various systems on the plane were shut off, but signals continued to emanate from backup systems, making small contacts with the Inmarstadt system. These messages were not complete, nor did they give an exact location. However, the satellites indicated that the plane's last contact was at 8.11 a.m. Malaysian time on Saturday, March 8th. That meant that while the initial announcements of the missing plane were made by the Malaysian government on March 8th at around 7.30 a.m., the plane was still in the air, somewhere much further south. That's haunting to think about. It's so eerie to think that they how little information they had and were able to at least make that announcement to families, not knowing that it was still up, you know, it was not Mm -hmm. crashed. It was not. (sighs) It's also, I don't really understand how, and I've seen six and even other studies say seven hours. If he had only put enough extra fuel for two additional hours to fly, how could you fly for six to seven additional hours? You shut more and more systems off to conserve more and more fuel. And then there is a third engine that only runs uh, some pertinent electrical systems that has jet fuel in it as well. Just a little bit of an amount. But any plane, whether it's a tiny prop plane all the way up to a wide body jet like this one, as long as you maintain control uh, behind the yoke and you don't dip the nose or put it up to stall it, if you maintain it on a straight and level moment like little by little as the fuel starts to die one engine will die and then the other one but if you kill the other engine and you maintain it on a certain course you can actually you're just a glider so you're just you'll coasting, just kind of you're going to keep coasting so at the area at which the the inmarsat data says that you know it stopped flying it's almost uh, over 100 nautical miles further than what they thought that you would even be able to keep flying at unless you did what some have speculated which is pull taking the aircraft down from a higher altitude at a quick speed in order to gain more momentum and then bringing it back level in which case you're kind of mm. going straight and level you bring it down at a sharp angle to increase your velocity and then you pull it straight again then you could keep gliding for even further which again you would have had to have practiced you'd have yeah. to know maybe you had about 18 hours thousand hours of flight time but something like that where then you're you're able to just rocket yourself a little bit further and then do a a controlled kind of miracle on the Hudson type of landing eventually when you get down to it. Wow. You would be going pretty fast still. I mean, if you had done that in order to get as far as the, this data indicates that it got. Well, if you'd practiced it a bunch on a flight simulator, you might feel like you had um, a, a leg up on that. Yeah. You know, if it's not your first time, you're like, and this is the time when I do this. Mm-hmm. And this, I mean, it's very calculating. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about it, like you're at the top of a huge hill and Mm -hmm. you are on roller skates and you roller skate down the hill, once you reach like a level straight point, the faster you were going, the longer Mm -hmm. you're going to go on that straight area. Yeah. And the sharper that hill is. So then even if the main engines are dying of fuel, if you still have enough control with that third engine that helps to, you know, helps power other systems, you'd still be able to pull back and, you know, Mm -hmm. the flaps and everything, you know, the mechanical parts of the plane still work. So it's a haunting thing to think, certainly, Mm -hmm. but that is an estimate of from aviation experts of why it was able to continue going even further than what fuel would otherwise let it. 
Yeah. Also, I know at least one pilot, Meredy, listens to this. So please text me if I'm wrong about my, <laughs> my plane explanations. I also think um, it's telling that maybe you could get away with asking for um, a little bit extra fuel, but to fly for six, seven extra hours might raise some eyebrows. But if you're like, well, two is like, not that much, but like it's still enough to where I know I'm going to be able to get to where I need to be. And then I can, you know, do my little coasting thing for the rest yeah. of the time. I was like trying to do the math of like, okay, you take off from Kuala Lumpur at 1240. You're supposed to land at 630. So, you know, it's about a six hour flight. So, yeah, if you got eight hours worth of fuel and you burn up an hour going you know, tr to the waypoint in Gari before you turn the transponder off and turn. Yeah. You know, you'd have to burn like two hours, but you'd still have six hours. And then if you knew to glide and to pull that, you know, the, the strong descent to get further, you could be mm -hmm. like, I could fly for an extra hour even mm -hmm. with nothing. The satellite pings only gave a general location, which required experts to track the potential trajectory and adjust the search area. Using satellite pings and the trajectory of other aircraft in the air that day, Experts tracked the flight's likely route. The Malaysian government announced on March 24th that the final resting place of the plane was likely an area much further south of Malaysia, all the way down in the Indian Ocean, about 3,000 miles off the coast of Perth, Australia. Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott called it the most inaccessible spot, if you can imagine, on the face of the earth. He then promised that despite the challenges, they would find it. It's the part of the globe when you spin it and it's the bottom and it's just all blue. It's down there in the all blue part. Yeah, in the deepest depths where um, who knows what's down there because people haven't been down there, at least not living ones, to report back. Oh. It's The ocean is so big that so vast. even, I mean, I think even if it crashed where they originally thought it had, is it possible more likely that they would find something sure but it's also like currents and shit and stuff down there like it could just get whisked away before anybody is any wiser but especially yeah. all the way down in australia you're just like in the middle of like the depths of the abyss down there it's you're just you're never gonna get found yeah it's so deep and uh, an oceanographer from western australia university described it as he said it's as if you're trying to search the entire island of tasmania from three miles in the air in a helicopter but you're not allowed to look you can only use sounds because oh. you can't see and it's just as dense and terrain because they're really down there there's the seafloor is not just like aerial like sand. under the sea flat yeah yeah it's not just flat sand it's like mm -hmm. a whole mountain range mm -hmm. so there's just a mountain range three miles under the ocean so you're mm -hmm. like already at a disadvantage that you cannot search a mountain range without even being able to see it and it wasn't until the last three four years that it's even been mapped so it's like yeah. we think based on sonar it might be like this but we don't even actually know where to search and it's subject to a ton of earthquakes down there. So it's just Tony Tony Abbott wasn't lying when it's the most it's inaccessible spot on the face of the earth. It's yeah. it's hard to get to. It's hard for research vessels, for military vessels to get to. It, yeah, it's just the part of the ocean I don't want to be on, honestly. No, no, no. And um, if you're trying to crash a plane and not have it found – and you know this about the ocean, that might be your target point. Yeah, it's probably the best place to go if you were intentionally trying to m mm -hmm. go missing just on account of it's so hard to get to. But I mean, for the families, this is now March 24th that it's taken you that many, almost not quite a month, you know, multiple weeks after your family member has gone missing to go, hey, by the way, the first place that are bad, it wasn't that. The second place, also was not that. Turns out it's actually extremely far away where it's technically in Australian waters. So we're going to have to contact a whole other country to help us. Yeah. And you're like, why? Why would they be there? That's not I mean, even close I, to where. No, it would be, it would drive me mad to try. And if I didn't have all the pieces to try and figure out like, how did this happen? You yeah. know, like what is what is the motive here? Who stands to gain anything from this? And then once you start pulling at those threads, I think you would get somewhere. 
Yeah. And it's, it's especially that why are they even down there? And in fact, where even would it be? And even with the Inmar sat, the satellite data they have, they can only say, we think it's kind of along this like band, this arc. They can't even say, okay, we kind of figured out this square area. Now, the more and more technology that comes out, you start figuring that out. But to your point earlier, of like we how do we even search it with all the ocean currents and air france flight went down um before this a couple years before this they knew where it had gone down they had gotten uh, the technical distress signal that a piece of the plane that's very vital to it had gotten frozen something had gotten the defrost thing had gotten unplugged and yada yada it, it basically completely malfunctioned oopsie. and caused yeah i mean it caused the plane Remember, to go down like that made a big oopsie you know, it's like if you there's it's so many tiny little things that all you can do is go, OK, now going forward on all flights, this thing has to be automated because we cannot leave this up to human error. But mm -hmm. like this one object, you know, froze and caused the plane to go down. So even with like the distress signals, alerts that went out because it was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, it was they didn't know where it was for. It took them two years to find yeah. that wreckage, knowing where it went down. And no. uh, the, that same oceanographer pointed out. We knew where the Titanic sunk. It took us 100 years to find it. And we knew exactly where it sunk. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, where it is. it's the hubris of man to think, well, we know where it went down. It should be easy to find it. And without thinking, we know nothing when it yeah. comes to the ocean. And also, our all of our technology, it's kind of powerless when it comes to Mother Nature and what she's capable of. And so... You might even know exactly where it went and you still can't find it. But then you're like, well, there's three areas that we're searching. Mm -hmm. So you're just, I mean, needle in a haystack doesn't even begin to describe it. You're just mm -hmm. kind of hoping you run across something so you can have some information, but you're just looking at open water. Yeah, you're looking at the whole big blue flat surface, not mm -hmm. to mention what you're actually looking for is most likely another three, four miles mm -hmm. down. It's yeah, wild. you're hoping to see like something floating on top in yeah. this vast expanse of just endless blue. The mm -hmm. chances of seeing that are so slim to none that, again, probably a naive or stupid thing to say, but like what all is down there? We don't know. Yeah. There's so much down know. there that we don't know. There's so like many 500. planes, boats, cities, things, no question mark. treasures, yeah, aliens. I mean, there's so much stuff down there that we can't even begin to comprehend. And then it's like, well, we think it got crashed into the most um, inaccessible. Like we know the whole ocean's pretty inaccessible, but this is the most inaccessible part of it. So good luck. Yeah, it's and you just being like, we're we're working on it. We'll do as best mm -hmm. we can. But knowing even knowing, like I said, where that Air France flight went down, it still took two more years. So you're a family going, well, we you're guessing where to search. Yeah, great. You just have nothing. Sinisterhood will be right back. You got two kids. How's it dressing them? Easy? No, never. God <laughs> bless America. I was trying to put just shorts on Simon the other day and the amount of struggle and wanting to it's just i'm i thought to myself why why son <laughs> are what is happening but if the clothes are super cute and especially soft they're all about soft clothes it's mm. much easier for me to get them in them well, that's why we love Caden Lane. Caden Lane was started in 2005 by a single mom who wanted to create better and cuter clothes, accessories, and keepsakes for her own children and for those special moments you remember forever. And that shows up in their Color Me pajamas. You can color your pajamas, Heather. You Stop can it. color them with markers. How much fun would it have been when we were young to like be in our room, in our pajamas, in the dark, and getting to color them? Next level. Next, it's next level. Level. It makes bedtime fun and enjoyable. Or they're great about hiding extra zips and snaps in outfits to make it easier to get those little ones dressed because toddlers and babies are freakishly strong. And they fight you. <laughs> we are adults and somehow still they can like maneuver and get the they're they're crafty. So you gotta have <laughs> little extra zips and snaps. You need somebody that's got your back that's helping you out. And that's well, what that's Kate Lane, Lane does. 
Mm -hmm. You see these brands go viral and you wonder if they're worth the hype. Well, we can tell you Caden Lane absolutely is. They have over 70,000 five-star reviews and millions of customers for a reason. It's summertime. Yes, I'm saying it's summertime. We're it, already it there like in it. Texas. <laughs> <laughs> is it spring? Maybe it's summer, I think, already over here, which is great because Caden Lane's new swim collection is here for worry free fun in the sun. You can keep your little one's sensitive skin safe with their UPF 50 plus sun protection swimwear. The only thing harder than getting a kid dressed is putting sunscreen on them when they're wiggling mm -hmm. and they want to go just jump in the pool. If you got a bathing suit that takes care of that for you on most of their body parts, perfect. Game changer. And yeah, it's a game changer. If you like to dress your whole family in matching swimwear, which I have some friends that absolutely do, Kate and Lane's got you. They got matching swimsuits for the entire family. Yes, and not only that, they have wonderful accessories. I even got my mom a beautiful blanket that says, we love you, mom, that I was able to give her for Valentine's Day that is so cozy and cuddly. And you got one for Simon, too, that yes. has trucks on it. It has his name. It's personalized. It has trucks. Mm -hmm. It is the softest blanket in the house. And mm -hmm. it's thicker than most of, like, those soft, you know, fleecy-type mm -hmm. blankets. But it's a better material. And... It's also bigger, so you don't feel like you got to, like, scrunch up into a tiny little ball to cover your whole body when you're laying down. Like, it's it's perfect. It's a hit. It's his favorite blanket, too. Caden Lane is your one-stop shop for all your newborn, infant, and toddler apparel. Head to CadenLane.com slash creepy and use code creepy for 20% off your order. Once again, that's C-A-D-E-N-L-A-N-E dot -E com backslash creepy for 20% off. And make sure you use our promo code creepy so they know we sent you. Captain Shaw's house was searched by Malaysian authorities on March 15th, 2014. The search was conducted to gather any potential evidence or clues that could have shed light on his state of mind. Police seized his computers and his at-home flight simulator and analyzed the data, looking for any similarities to the trajectory of MH370. The results of these troubling searches would be withheld from families for more than a year. When Joint Agency Coordination Center, or JACC, spokesman Scott Mashford confirmed to CNN in an email in 2016 that the MH370 captain's flight simulator showed someone had plotted a course to the southern Indian Ocean. Theories surrounding what may have happened to flight MH370 took a dark turn. So what do we think? Well, based on this initial thing, uh, and we can go over some of the uh, changes and upgrades that have been made, but you really just see how vulnerable any of us are to what the authorities we put in charge, the airlines that we put in charge, to these policies and procedures and things. And we think, oh, well, everybody sh is trained and know what's knows what they're doing and they're of sound mind. I'll be fine. And these are things we have to tell ourselves. We'll, we'll never get on a fucking airplane or yeah. a bus or a car or anything. And, you know, s scenarios like this are extremely rare. But when they happen, they're always, always, always an opportunity to go, we've got to really look into what led to this being even possible to happen and then what made it so much worse like the second the transponders turned off do not pass go do not collect two hundred dollars mm -hmm. like they will send like you have to scramble jets yeah no i totally agree i will get into um more of captain shaw's mental state of mind at the time and stuff they found in his house and other theories too that people subscribe to in the second episode but um, yeah, I would, I, my theory is that he in, intentionally downed the plane, um, because, uh, he was unhappy with his life and, um, wanted to take his life and unfortunately took 238 people with him, which seems so unnecessary. Um, not seems it is so unnecessary, but it's uh there's some stuff we're talk about in the second episode specifically about like this Perth Australia like why there well it happened to be really close to Captain Shaw's homeland and yeah. um a lot of people speculated he was taking one last flyby 
to get a look at that before ending his life. So I think that we need to look at what led up to, to him getting to that point and how we need to have better mental health, uh, better mental health services available for people and just recognizing that and destigmatizing it. However, if that part's been missed and then somebody like that gets behind the yolk, you have to follow the protocol that you've put in place for situations like this, where something bad has happened. We don't know what, but we have to get in contact with them. And it can't just be like, well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's probably fine because it's not like the worst thing ever happened. And perhaps it wouldn't have if after five minutes, somebody's on the phone with somebody saying, we need to figure out what's going on up there. And then you contact the military and they get jets up there and somebody can stop what's happening from happening and save these yeah. people. Yeah. And at least have some sort of early intervention or if it's, you know, sadly too late that, you know, the people on board have been killed by a depressurization event or something like that to then prevent the plane from going somewhere where it would be dangerous for other civilian, you know, people around crashing into building places, whatever, on mm -hmm. purpose or on accident and to just not lose the whole entire aircraft. And I yeah. think that's what has been the most shocking to everybody of like, we go, oh, there's a black box on board. And it's like, you got to find it. Yeah. And listen, yeah. it has a beacon on it and a little beam. And we'll talk about a little bit in part two, some of the science that's used to find those things. But it's not the same as like, I just assumed, you know, an air tag kind of a situation where, but it's a mega super duper powerful. And no matter what, you can always track a plane. And that's not true. It was subject to these super faint things. And thank God this satellite happened to be able to see it because without that, I think it would be an extremely futile search in an area where clearly the plane did not go. And absent this, the satellites that if you have everything else under control of, I turned off the transponder, I've, you know, figured out how to fly where ATC is not going to bug me. The one thing you can't plan for is some British telecommunications company you've never heard of who runs its satellites and just, they get the info because they got the money and they got the satellites you can't keep them from tracking you and then therefore that's like the one like wrinkle in your whole plan so that's the prevailing theory uh, and well there's obviously other theories because nothing has been proven 100% but i think the prevailing theory the most supported theory given the deliberate purposeful actions by a person who would need to have the qualifications that it just so happened this captain had points towards the pilot takeover. You know, they said the the Malaysian authorities keep going inter the intervention by a third party. And even the family member of one of the crew says, you know, I think it's so wrong to accuse him. He's a man that can't defend himself. And that's all fair. But I think, you know, it's kind of like you say it without saying it. Every aviation professional that looks at this goes, you would need to have a lot of knowledge to do A, B, C, D, and E. And if it were this, you know, disaster event, he would have landed at the nearest place within a certain amount of time. Or it would not have continued to fly on. You know, if there was some horrible cockpit fire and that's how mm -hmm. the transponder got turned off then that would mean the plane would have gone down and it would not have made a super deliberate turn like an hour later. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's impossible. Like somebody flipped the switch of the transponder and it's located in an area of the cockpit that you didn't just bump it with your elbow. It's kind of like an important yeah. thing. So it's far up and away and you have to really snap it if you want to turn it off. Or also, if it was, they shouldn't be allowed to turn those off. My opinion. Yeah. Yeah. It is weird. Like why? If there's no reason for you to turn that off, why is it even an option? I can get more information for the next time, but it's my understanding that the flip that he switched that turns that off, it's that he he was turning off an electrical system that also operated that. And you would be able to turn that off in case of like a fire or something. But my thing is like, did have it on a battery somewhere else, back it up or what, you yeah. know, it, you should never be able to hide in a, a commercial air aircraft because there are strangers no. on board. You shouldn't you don't get to hide us. No, not it's for many reasons. And as far as like a third party and that is a theory that we will discuss. It's it seems unlikely to me though because no one took credit for this. Like no yeah. country like took credit for a hijacking or anything. We never heard in the news it's um anything like 
any kind of advantage came from someone hijacking that, you know what I mean? Like if mm-hmm. it was a nine 11 situation, like, well, that plane didn't crash into another country's buildings and a mm-hmm. war wasn't started. You know I mean? It seems like unless he was being forced to turn that off, turn the plane manually, fly all the way out there with literally like a gun to his head, he had to have done it on his own accord. And I don't think the other, the co-pilot had enough experience to be able to do something like that or any motive. Well, and yeah, I don't think he would have the skill to fly along predetermined paths Mm -hmm. that are safe for civilian aviation, being only 27, being that young. And you have to point out that when you go into training in pilot training in a flight simulator, it is my understanding you are not allowed to practice crashing for funsies. If you got Microsoft Flight Sim at home, you kind of do whatever you want to do and practice as many crashes or wacky, crazy ass people on TikTok will stream Microsoft Flight Sim and do, you know, all kinds of, you know, dangerous stuff mm-hmm. uh, purposefully to just, it's like when we kill people on the Sims, we're all perverts underneath yeah. and we like to do it. But whenever somebody's profession is this, you don't want them to even get into the habit of mm-hmm. doing this. And it was, I believe, an aviation expert on 60 Minutes Australia. 60 Minutes Australia has done extremely in-depth and excellent coverage of this case as well, which tons of their stuff's linked in our show notes. But they interviewed a guy and he's just like, they don't even let you practice in the flight sim because they don't want you to get that good feeling of like, oh, if you like it, you know, they don't want you to do that. Mm. So the fact that he's doing it at home Mm -hmm. where he's not going to get in trouble or caught or whatever. Why do you need to do that? Why do you need to know how to do that? Yeah. Yeah, it's one thing if it goes, you know, he did these 10 routes and he, you know, logged 50,000 hours at home just on his same routes that he was doing or like he flew to Paris for fun on the thing. But the fact that he flew to a place where you literally will run out of fuel and die and that's where then satellite data said the plane went to. It is hard for me to square those facts with Mm -hmm. any of the other theories, but there's... And next of kin, like we said, they're not a monolith. Some of them think absolutely Captain Shaw would never do this. It must have been X, Y, and Z. And there's plenty of other theories that we'll get into in part two as well. So, yeah. Yeah. There's no shortage of information, docu-series, documentaries, 60 minutes. There's all sorts of stuff. So you can go check out all of that stuff that we've linked in the show notes and get caught up and have even more information before part two. Yeah. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. This episode of Sinisterhood is made possible with the help of our amazing patrons. If you're interested in supporting the show, consider joining our Patreon. You'll get access to ad-free regular episodes, weekly bonus content, you're able to vote on episode topics, join our monthly live streams, and more. Keep it creepy. (laughs) Mwahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahah